You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Welcome to the Rock Your Restaurant Podcast, engaging topics that help restaurants build their brands, rock their profits, and deliver amazing guest service experiences. Today's topic is what happened to the service in the service business. Now, I'm passionate about the restaurant industry and about running restaurants, so I'm so excited when I meet a kindred spirit. So today's guest is Chef James Clary. Now, James has a great story about the true meaning of hospitality, his early inspirations, mentors, how he got into this business, and finally, how he went on to open fine dining establishments. So he and I think alike, and we believe the same thing, so I can't wait to get into this. So welcome, Chef. How are you today? Hey, Roger. Good morning, my friend. How are you? I am just great. Super great. So, you know, James, we talked about this before, but I am so amazed constantly because I eat out across the country and I'm sure you do too. And just in my, in the course of working with restaurants, so few restaurants seem to really get what that true meaning of hospitality is. And beyond that, they're, they're running restaurants and they're not running businesses. And what do I mean by that? Well, you and I both know that there's just a thousand details to running restaurants and there's so many moving parts, right? But again, they're first and foremost in the hospitality business, but they're missing hospitality. You want to share some thoughts on that? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I I think you kind of nailed it. Really, for me, Roger, hospitality is is from the – and I always get get the two sides of the brain confused. It's the emotional side of the brain. You know, it's – hospitality comes from your heart. It doesn't come from your head. And – That's where I think the difference, you know, um, you and I both have like uh, comprehensive training programs for servers and I actually split mine into two parts. One's called basic service rules and I would say that's the mechanics of service. That's the head stuff, right? Then I have another part called key service attitudes and I always say, well, that's the heart stuff because it's, it's things like loyalty and a sincere desire to please better than anyone else has before and uh, treat your guests as if they were the most important thing in your life. And I always make the point on that one as well. I, actually, at that point in time, they are. I mean, what do you have more important than those people that are sitting in front of you? And it, unless you are serving guests from the heart, I think you're in the wrong business. I really do. If, if you're just in it for the money and you, you have all these rules in your head, you know, serve from the left with the left hand, whatever, coffee mm-hmm. cup at mm-hmm. four o'clock, you know, that stuff's all great. But let me tell you, guests know. They can tell the kind of people that genuinely have a passion for serving them. You know, you are so right about that. And everything that you said just spoke to me on such a personal level because I was in the business for 20 years and one of the first guiding philosophies I had was treat every guest as if they were the only guest in the place. Even if you've got a, you know, 250 seat restaurant and it's full, you want to treat every customer as if they were the most important customer or the only customer. And that's hard to do when with so many moving pieces, but that should be the guiding philosophy. You should train your staff to approach every table that way. So we totally agree yeah. on that. That's that's awesome. So, so that and you know that and kind of brings me to another point yeah, for please. our listeners, particularly managers and owners as they're doing hiring. I mean, you have to figure out the kind of people that are genuinely and honestly sincere in their desire to please. And and Roger, you and I have talked about this before that uh, you know hiring is a huge part of it because if you get people who are in there just for the the money. Uh, you have a problem. And as you know, our industry uh, has more than its fair share of scallywags, if you will. Yes, this right? is true. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. true. And every restaurant will end up with some of those. But, you know, sure. you know, having a company culture that's based on hospitality, based on serving, you know, I always hired people for their approach, their um, attitude and their desire to truly please the customer far above experience and that served me really well over the years so i totally agree with that that's 
That's it, just yeah, and, and I think it's a major mistake that a lot of guys make. They look to the experience first. And if you truly embrace the the old adage, hire for attitude, train for skill, right? If you embrace that, yes. then when you sit down in an interview and you're looking across this person, it, the first question normally is like, okay, so tell me where you've worked and for how. You know what? That question becomes irrelevant. Why do you care that? <clears throat> I mean, yes, it's an added bonus if you get experience. What what I my message to operators is, look, Forget about the experience like you just said. Look for who the person is and their attitude. Then let's talk experience after that. I love it. That's absolutely true. So I mentioned a minute ago, you know, I travel quite a bit and I dine out across the great country of ours all the time. And it doesn't matter where I am. I could be in Toledo, Ohio or Topeka, Kansas or a real food city like, you know, New Orleans or San Francisco. Chicago. But yeah. yeah, really. I mean, I'm, I'm across the map all the time and it doesn't matter where I am. Nine times out of 10, I still get what I call an order taker. And these people, they might be perfectly friendly. They might be personable. But they're taking the order, bringing the food, you know, and delivering the check. And to me, that's just an ordinary experience. And they're, you know, they're just giving guests average experiences that aren't amazing dining experiences. And I'm sure that happens to you. Do you have any stories to share? Does that happen to you too? Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, I think it is the norm. And, and really, if you think about it, if that's all you're going to be, you know, we should, you know, if that's your restaurant, you've got, you know, let's say 10 order takers working there, you know, five per shift, you might as well automate, right? You, yeah. you might as well get a conveyor belt that goes to the kitchen and right. the, the ticket right. and just put the food on the line. And, oh my gosh. And, you know, there's two things to that. You know, when you said they, they don't deliver the wow experience, number one is selling. And I think a lot of servers that I've trained are hesitant to sell. They believe that they're being pushy. And I'm like, no, guests want to be sold to. Yes, there's an inappropriate way to sell. You right. can be pushy, but I'm not teaching you to be no. pushy. I'm teaching, teaching you to offer all of the great things that our restaurant has to offer, right? And then the other thing is just in the, um, you know, we always try to, to say, you know, you uh, when you're waiting on a table, it's like uh, you're building a new friendship and it's a, it's a mini kind of mini version of, uh, of a friendship experience, whether like if you go to the park with a friend, you know, you're having this conversation and you're talking about all kinds of things. And in that situation, a server's got to dig deep and, and think, what can I do to make this guest's experience over the top? And who knows what it could be, Roger? I mean, you got to be creative about that. You know, it may be that the uh, the 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 person's getting married or something. And you make the whole proposal really special, but just something that that's going to make them remember you as a server and hopefully mm -hmm. ask for you. I know you Absolutely. had a real high high, uh, a high percentage of call tables at your place, didn't you? Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, but that, that that's was huge. you know. Yeah. You build a dream team staff and you're delivering these amazing dining experiences and then your customers, of course, are coming back, but they're, they're asking for the staff by name because they had such a great time last time. So there is definitely yeah. something really, really powerful about that. You know, no doubt about yeah, it. Yeah, without a doubt. Yep. Well, I've got a story to share because you touched on the two basics, the two different types of service training in your restaurant. And you had the basics about, okay, which fork goes with which course and, you know, which side do you serve from and all that. So, you know, I moved to Sun Valley, Idaho almost two years ago from Portland, Maine. And Portland is a big food city. And there's yeah. lots of chef-owned fine dining places, probably similar to what you had. And my wife and I dined out with a few friends just before we moved here. And it was a really nice chef-owned place. You'd walk in and the ambiance was over the top. You know, heavy velvet drapes hanging in front of giant picture windows and beautiful lighting and heavy substantive silverware and beautiful purple yeah. linen tablecloths. And you get the idea. Yeah, so sure, sure. we had a server. 
and she knew absolutely everything about the menu. She could, if you asked any question, she could, she talked about flavor profiles and presentations. I mean, she could answer anything. She knew that menu inside and out. And they also had a very extensive cocktail, specialty cocktail list. And this server could literally tell you about any cocktail as if she was the bartender making it. So at first, we were really, really impressed. The ambiance was great. The server was super knowledgeable. But then everything changed. It's like there were never any recommendations. You know, she for, she missed a wine. We ordered a glass of wine. She never suggested that we have a bottle. She missed our second cocktail order. She was basically an order taker that was a, an extremely knowledgeable one. So she didn't make any suggestions. We were first time visitors. And I guess that's another point I'd like to make. No matter what type of restaurant you have, every day in our restaurants, we're getting new customers all the time. And these are first time visitors that, like you said, they don't know the first thing about what's special. So servers should never feel that it's pushy if they're simply making suggestions that we know our guests will enjoy. And it is that simple. So, you know, yeah. every server, every every hostess literally can take guests on what I call the magical journey. Everything that's special about the menu, everything that's special about the restaurant, educate our customers, entertain them, and that's what's gonna bring them back. So, you know, we, we figured when we left this dining experience that we probably would have spent another 80 to $100. There were five of us, and she, this restaurant was famous for its chef-made homemade desserts. Never a suggestion. We ordered oh. coffee at the end of the meal. It was, do you think she asked us, would you prefer Bailey's in your it, coffee or it, maybe a little Kalura or, Frangelico, dollop of whipped cream, some chocolate? Oh, just yeah. missed all the details, even though she knew everything about the menu. So that's a difference too. So again, you know, thousand moving pieces, but we're in a service business. It's all about hospitality. And so many restaurants aren't training their staff on those, you know, on the hospitality basics. So anyway, let's we, we go ahead if you add some more to that. No, I was just going to say, I was going to say, you know, look, Roger, you and I get it. I mean, we've had our own place. You know, we know how busy you are, how busy you are. You know, that's part of why, uh, why you and I, Roger, uh, have a job because we help other restaurants. But you can't ever use being too busy as an excuse not to train your staff. No probably. doubt about it. There's nothing more important. It's the absolute foundation of running a restaurant. Training is yeah. the most important thing because every day yeah. you're leaving impressions on your guests. And every single person that works for you is an impression and a lasting impression. So it's unfortunate yeah. that, you know, so many restaurants are leaving impressions that unfortunately leave those first time visitors as one timers and not repeat guests. Yeah, it's really sad. It, it truly is. And and you do see it. I mean, you expect it at, at chain restaurants. But when you go to a place like the place you describe, yeah, you really expect better than that. And, I, you know, I applaud that that server that you had for for having the product knowledge, because really, that's a big part of it. Yes. But man, you got to finish the deal with the sales, right? You know, and it's not push, like you said, it's not pushing, it's offering. It's all you're doing. You're exactly. offering. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you have an amazing story that really, really inspired me. And I'd really like, you know, you to share with our listeners exactly where, you know, where that hospitality first hit you and, and you said, oh, this means something to me and I want to get involved in this business. And you had a mm -hmm. lot of inspiration. So why don't you take us through your journey and we'll get into that a little bit. Sure. And I'll try and keep it brief. <laughs> as I as I told you, uh, I grew up in a home. Well, and not just a home, Roger. I grew up in an era where entertaining was important. And, and you don't see that now. I mean, about the length most people go to in entertaining is like they'll go to Bunko with their girlfriends. You know, I mean, that's their idea of having a part. Man, my parents and their friends, their circle of, you know, 60 other couples, they were going to a party every week. Somebody was having a party, you know? And if you went to a party, uh, etiquette reciprocated, right? So my parents would reciprocate and they'd have two or three big parties a year. And, and and not big parties. They'd have, you know, people over for the dinner all the time. And so anyway, I learned from that that I always found myself in the kitchen with the caterers when my parents had a party. If they had a big party, they'd hire a caterer. Often they did their own 
cooking because they were both great. So I learned great food from my, my folks. I'm thinking I got to taste an 1800 vintage pork when I was 10. So, yeah. I mean, you know, nice. uh, my dad let me have a little sip. Sure. Yeah. So that kind of stuff. I grew up in that environment. Uh, but then, um, I don't know, by the time I was 15 or so, I, well, 16, I would say, I'd been working in restaurants two years. I got hired summer after my freshman year in high school. I started working in restaurants. I loved the business, the instant I, and I was a dishwasher at first, but I loved it. I didn't like washing dishes that much. It was fine. I didn't really care. But the hustle, the bustle, the environment. And I don't know. I, I think maybe I was born a person who enjoys the people-pleasing aspect of it. Um, so anyway, I thought about uh, when I was 16, 17, I remember the idea began to formulate, you know what I want to do with my life is I want to own a restaurant. I just didn't know how I could do it. And, you know, it's weird. My path, you never know one person can make such a difference. I don't think I ever told you this. Do you, do you know Brad Ogden is? He's, uh, oh, he was at Campton Place in San Francisco, turned that hotel around. Then he moved to Larkspur and opened his first place, Ogden's, or, no, Lark Creek Inn in Larkspur, uh -huh. yep. north of San Francisco. He had a place in Caesars. You know, he's got several cookbooks. He's a big time dude. Anyway, he was in Springfield, Missouri at one point in 1978. And, and this guy hired him to do this million dollar restaurant, which in 78 in this little town was a fortune. Nobody spent a million bucks on a restaurant. But anyway, Brad pulled me aside, pulled me into his office. I thought I was in trouble. You know, I went, oh, no. And he goes, young man, you have a knack for this. You really do. And I'd like to help you go to chef school. He went to CIA and then he went to Cordon Bleu to finish his training and he goes, look, I'll write the letter. I'll get you in the CIA. And then if you want, you can go to Court on Blue and Paris. Those words, I didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah, First, I yeah, thought he was but... talking about an intelligence agency. You know? But that really had an effect on me. And I didn't go that route. And you know, there's been many times in my life I've looked back at that offer. I'm like, why didn't you do that, you idiot? But you know, I was too into other things sure. that were not as fruitful at the time. So what? would your life have I went like... to, yeah, life right? does that. But I went to school in Tulsa. Um, I always worked while I was in college and bartending or cooking in restaurants. You know, that's what I knew. And when I got out, I got married. And um, to try, I'm like, okay, I have to fulfill this dream owning my restaurant. I don't, I don't have any management on my resume. So I took the first assistant manager position, which was at a pizza, a pizza place, a new concept. And uh, it's really interesting. My my future mentor, a guy named Robert, who managed uh, the dining room at Southern Hills, a very famous country club. You know, they've had 10 U.S. Opens there or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then he opened his own place called the Polo Grill. Uh, he used to pick up pizzas on his way home at this place. And he remembered me from dining at Southern Hills when I was in college it was just kind of a weird thing that he actually remembered, but he was that kind of guy, you know. He'd meet someone and he would remember him because right. he was a hospitality. Yeah, maitre right? d', yeah. make friends with yeah. everyone. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, and he was consummate. He was trained in Beverly Hills. He worked at La Familia in Beverly Hills. So, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. he had really, really exceptional service training. So he put an ad in the paper, assistant manager, Polo Grill, and I saw it. And I'm like, man, I think I know the guy that owns it. Anyway, I went down there, and uh, he asked me one question. What do you want to do with your life? I said, I want to own my own restaurant. And he's like, okay, you're hired. Because he knew that I didn't have the – that I wasn't ready to own my own restaurant. I wouldn't be there. And he knew that if I would take the job and work my tail off uh, to get the knowledge. And that's exactly what happened. And I worked for him for five years. Uh, he solidified my train. I had a pretty good background in the kitchen. I didn't know the rest of it. And Robert really gave me the whole package from the service and the office end of it, which I think is an area restaurateurs overlook sometimes, right? You get a lot of guys coming out of chef school. They never had any service training and they don't know the first thing about numbers. Yeah, that's a recipe for disaster, pun intended. Oh, yeah. We know a lot about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you had the right stuff and he recognized that you had the right stuff and that you were passionate and that you were trainable and that you were going places. So, yeah, I mean, what an amazing experience. It's like lightning struck. Yeah, it is. And the other thing is, you know, 
when I remember when I left, they had two restaurants, the Polo Grill and a place called La Cuisine. La Cuisine was uh, Blue Willow, French Bistro, all white pine, beautiful place. When I, I, I had been at La Cuisine for two years and, you know, yes, I was a corporate officer, so I kind of managed both restaurants. But my time on the floor, my service time was spent in the dining room at La Cuisine, not in the kitchen, in the dining room. I ran dining rooms for years. That's why people see a chef coat and they get confused. But when I left, Robert said to me uh, a couple months later, he goes, no, we have, there's no personality in the dining room at La Cuisine. And I, I mean, I, I really, uh, I mean, that kind of touched me, but it also made me realize, wow, I guess you need a personality in the dining room. You do. Yes. Yeah. Presence. And if it's not your hostess, then it needs to be you or whoever, right? Yeah, for sure. And your servers each should be their own personality, but <clears throat> particularly if there's a, if there's a problem on a table or guests just love having the owner or the manager come to their table. So, you know, I would say to, to our listeners, if you're an owner who's not engaged with your guests, get off your rear and get out in the diner and say hi to your customers, right? Definitely. Everyone wants to, you know, be recognized and to feel as though they're special and everyone knows who the owner is. But if the owner's not on the floor, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. You know, and it's a yeah. personal touch and you want every person interacting with your guests, touching them in a personal way. But it all starts at the top. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. I, I told you I had some friends in town. That, they got a great band. They're out of St. Louis. And, but they also happen to be huge foodies. And they uh, they used to headline in Vegas a lot. They actually still do. They fly out there a lot. They're, uh, but anyway, I had dinner with Paul. And Paul was like, man, we got to meet Danielle Boulet in Vegas. Nice. I mean, and he was just, he went on for 15 minutes. So, and, and of course, it's Danielle Boulet, right? It's, it's not James Clary, but... Uh, just the fact that Chef Boulet came out to the table to say hi just blew those right? guys away. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the rock stars, you know? Right. Yeah, but they were in awe. They were almost like dribbling idiots just that he was at their table because they are rock stars. These guys are, are rock stars in their own right. But they see a, a, a great chef as the ultimate celebrity, which uh, yeah. I don't know Rockstar about all that. Chef. But at least it's important to get to the table, right? Well, that's yeah. the concept for sure. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. So just before I'm going to ask you about how you started Clary's and how you got into fine dining and what that really mm -hmm. meant to you and that whole story. Let's go back. You told me a story about a bartender at some of those family mm -hmm. parties that really had an impact on you. And it was really about respect and about approach and about craft and i think that you know craftsmanship is lost on lots of service personnel today it's present in some restaurants but not all but you know it just comes down to that word your vocation your craft your approach your desire to serve the public and mutual respect back and forth so i think his name was sunny why don't you tell us sunny. about sunny yeah sunny harden uh Wow, he was he was such a fixture in the community. First of all, I mean, I will say Springfield has a very, uh, at least at the time, it's it's changed a bit. But uh, we were pretty monocultural, if you will. You know, um, there was a very small percentage of African American Black people uh, living here. I think it's about four percent. And yep. Sonny was was a Black guy. So it, you know, not that that matters, but it was kind of important just from the fact as a little kid, I hadn't met any African-Americans because Springfield is, is uh, what's the old term, Lily White almost. You know, it's yeah. changed a lot now. This was sure, back sure. in the 60s. Uh -huh. And there's reasons for that. But that's another conversation we can talk about that's more historical, which is my hobby history. But Sonny was the bartender that you hired if you're having a party, right? And I don't know, he and I just kind of hit it. He was the nicest man. And he just is a 10 year old kid. And here's this guy. And he always had this, this great white jacket with the black bow tie. You know, those old server jackets, of the course. white starch. Well, yeah. Yeah. Of course. And the black pants and the black bow tie. He just looked cool. And he was so nice to me, you know, that uh, I just grabbed it. As soon as he came in, I was like hanging on his pants leg. Yeah, and yeah. he, but, you know, I watched him, Roger, and I watched him interact with these guests. 
And he taught me this, this mad, everybody wanted to say hi to Sonny, partly because he had the booze, you know, back then, but it was really about Sonny. Yes. He knew everyone's name. He always had a comment like, how, how's your son doing that was in the bicycle rack? Or what? I mean, he knew everything and he was always polite, courteous, and he always made him laugh or smile. And it was magical. He was like a magician to me that could do that trick, you know, and make, and I'm like, man. That he has the power. I didn't, in my head, I didn't formulate it. But just in my heart, I'm like, I want to do whatever it is he does because it's magical to me. And mm-hmm. see how he lights those people up and oh, see yeah. how he makes them smile. And I love it. Um, but yeah, and you know what's really neat about Sonny? I mean, he, th- Roger, this is a guy who was a, a professional bartender. He never opened a restaurant or anything. He was, a, I say, only a professional bartender. That That means a lot in my book, in your book, I know. But... Um, you know, he put three three kids through college. His daughter, Charlotte, is a major pillar in this community. She's been on every board and city council. His grand his grand grandkids used to play basketball against my son's team. And so I actually got to see Sonny just before he passed in 2012. But he and I used to whenever I'd see him, we'd sit together and watch these games. Awesome. And, just an amazing man, amazing story. And he did have a big impact on me. He really did. So think about if you could capture that that whole persona and that whole approach to service and impart that into every hire in your restaurant. You know, if mm. your whole foundation of training was so service and hospitality based, how powerful would that be? I mean, I can picture Sonny, I can visualize what he looked like, what he sounded yeah. like, and the impression that he would leave on any person. I think we can all get that. Like that is to me, the epitome of service right there. So thanks for sharing that. I think that's what it's yeah. all about. You bet. You bet. And, and you're right. What if you could capture that? And really, Roger, I think you do this podcast, you know, to get information and, and valuable content to your listeners. And, and I want to say for any young people that, that are in the business or want to get in the business, really hear what Roger just said. I mean, that is the deal. And you, you, the server, are going to have to do that in your heart. Nobody can really do that for you. You have to make the decision. Am I going to be the person that against all odds, no matter what the stress, I'm always going to be kind, caring, loving, giving of myself? Well, now you're touching on that that subject about mentors. And I personally never had a mentor. I wish I did. You clearly had several mentors in your life. But you know, young people are entering this business. They're the foundation of the restaurant and hospitality industry. And people like you as natural mentors, because you were mentored, can make such yeah. an impact on, on these kids' lives. It's a proud industry. So many people have their first jobs in this industry. And wouldn't it be great if, you know, if you could share those, if we both can share those philosophies and just improve the business one young person at a time, because they really are the future of the industry, you know? Yeah. And I, powerful. I take it even further, Roger. I I say they're the future of America. Mm. I mean, no prouder moments have I had in my life when an old employee of mine gets in touch either because we've connected on Facebook for the first time or whatever. But really the one that just still gets me was a, an email I got. It was a very, yeah. rather long email, but it was from a guy that, that, you know, started as a bus boy, worked his way up to server, worked his way through college. And now he's like a VP in a huge pharmaceutical company. He's very high up, just making tons of dough and sent me this long email. I just, and basically said, look, of all the jobs, of all the schooling, everything I had, I learned more from you than any other job. And that just, ugh, talk about tugging on your heartstrings a little bit. You know, here's a guy who's yeah. uber successful and said, but the thing is, Roger, we teach things that aren't taught in other businesses. This because is true. service is about etiquette, right? It all has to start with etiquette. It really does. And good manners. And think about it. In, in today's busy world, Parents and families don't sit down and have dinner together every night. So there's no opportunity. A lot of these children have never been taught that the fork is on the left and that you grab the knife with your right hand, you know. So that's that's a challenge, uh, but it can be very rewarding when people get this. And I, man, I've even toyed with the idea, and I, hopefully I'll do it someday, of mm-hmm. a not-for-profit that takes 
inner city kids that don't have any opportunity, don't have any mentoring and gives them that mentoring through hospitality training, because I've seen it change lives and you have too. that what we do when you take someone and the light bulb goes off when they get all this information and they realize I can do anything with the tools that you've given me because we teach young people how to interact in society you know, it's not just about restaurants. It's about life. Man. Yeah. People skills, life skills. And that's yeah. what the hospitality business does for sure. That is a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up. Definitely. You know, in my restaurants, I had kids that would start at a 15 years old in the dish pit. And I had one yeah. who worked his way up, became the kitchen manager for several years. And then he went on to own his own restaurant. It's amazing what you can do. You know, without formal education, without going to culinary school, without going to college, it's like the basic skills you're talking about can take you anywhere if you have the approach, the desire, and, you know, the attitude and the passion. Yeah, it's so. and the passion. Yeah, you're right. And, and really, Roger, there's fewer and fewer industries now where you can do that. I mean, it used to be, you know, you could start, let's say, uh, uh, in manufacturing and you start on the line, you learn a little bit more and then you become a foreman and then you move your way sure. up. And a lot of those jobs are overseas now, but the hospitality business is still here and still doing strong. So it is a, and, and I think that, you know, that, that, that touches on a point that we as managers and owners need to remember when we're hiring, you know, to offer that, that path to the person that we're interviewing. Say, look, you, you want to make a career of it. You've found the place. I can do this for you. I, yes. It's like my old mentor, Robert, said, yes. I will teach you how to own your own restaurant. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I did the same. You know, this one gentleman that went on to own his own restaurant, I taught him business skills. I gave him all the basics of, you know, the hospitality thing, the financial analysis thing, all the critical things that are important and not just opening a restaurant, but running it profitably and successfully. So it's yeah. great. And, you, and we can't help too many people because literally you're right. This is the foundation of America and it, it contributes billions of dollars to the economy. You know, the restaurant industry uh -huh. is, is incredibly powerful and we know the statistics. So it's yeah. great that, that you've made such an impact. Let's get into talking about your um, entry into owning <clears throat> your own restaurants. Tell me about uh -huh. Clary's, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Just tell us a story. Well, yeah, as I mentioned, I was... Uh got hired by Robert in Tulsa. I was managing the pull grill. He then moved me to their sister restaurant, La Cuisine, which I mentioned, mm -hmm. because they felt that my presence was needed more there, because Robert really spent his service time at the pull grill. Uh, then they, they made me a corporate officer, which was a big deal, because it meant I could sign checks. They put me, you know, and that was a huge responsibility. Yeah. So then I learned, really began to learn, and I would meet with the accountants once a week to review invoices, review payroll, all those things, you know, that you have to do uh, as an owner. And uh, in 1988, uh, my wife at the time was working for MCI. This was before they crashed. And uh, we moved back to Springfield. She had a job opportunity. and I was ready. I'd been working with them for five years. And I called my brother and uh, he was in town managing a pizza place. I said, hey, let's do a restaurant together. Uh, we had no idea where we were going to go, how we we're going to do it. But uh, we, we, we catered. I knew we did a lot of catering from La Cuisine. So I'm like, well, here I am in Springfield, no job. And we, my wife and I rented a home, well, it's a modest three-bedroom ranch house. We still had a home that we had bought in Tulsa trying to sell it. And um, so we sent a, my brother and I sent a flyer out. We got the, the country club directory. We knew we wanted that upscale clientele. And that December, we did about 15 grand in business, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's two guys working on a four-burner GE stove. Let me tell you, it was a lot. <laughs> it was skin. This was 1988 prices, yes. too. Yes. But we got a lot of exposure from that. And then this location, which was perfect. And I think that's important. If anyone's listening, it's looking for uh, to open their own restaurant. I had written what's called a mission statement and pro forma. And I think that's the very first step you need to take. I think you would agree with me. Definitely. And yeah. And the mission yep. statement was just a one paragraph, one page that described what I envisioned in my head and the attributes 
that I thought were important for success of the restaurant. And in my mm -hmm. particular case, I wanted to be in the southeast part of town because that's where the growth was. And it's honestly where the money was. I was doing fine dining. So I needed to appeal to the the higher income levels. Now, if you're doing a, a, a fast food burger place, you may want a higher population density than me. So it, you know, Very you need true. to know what kind of restaurant you're going to open mm -hmm. and do the right market research for that restaurant. Yes. So this place came open just out of the blue. It was just perfect. The only problem, it had been four restaurants in four years. So I had a place like that once too, and it had a stigma I, to overcome, right? Yeah, exactly. The bank even said, oh, that's a snake bit location. Yes. Yeah. And we borrowed $50,000. to. We, the restaurant was operating, then it closed. So everything was there, the booths, the tables, the chairs. Awesome. I mean, you know, yeah. everything. You didn't have to buy much. No. And, and what we did is we painted everything in the dining room. We reupholstered and we did that ourselves. I'd never reupholstered anything, but my wife was kind of handy. She says, oh, here, we'll do it. We can do it. You know, you go buy the fabric, cut it out. You unscrew the, che the chair yes, cover. You should right. see the bottoms oh, of those chairs. I they had you. so many staples in them, <laughs> you know, because we were just like, <laughs> yes. but we did everything ourselves and we did it in 30 days, which I, oh looking gosh. back, I don't know how we did it. Yeah, uh, it's really crazy. Know. Those are great I memories. Know. Yeah, menu planning. I mean, I remember when the, the liquor guys came in and said, let's talk about the wine list. And they wanted to sit down and taste wines for her. And I go, here's my list. And I handed it to him. It, I said, if you don't have the wines, let me know. See you later. I mean, I didn't have time. You didn't, clearly. You know? And that's a fun part of the business that we all enjoy yeah. once we're up and running and established. But yeah, when you've got 30 days to open your doors and you got so much to do, it's like stick and move, I'm on to the next thing, and it's like, whoa. But you know, I love the guiding philosophy, the, the mission statement, because if you have nothing else, at least that's something to follow that you don't deviate from that literally spells out every aspect of what you hope to achieve. That's yeah, cool. that's true. Super cool. And you know, something I've never thought about, uh, our mutual friend, Eric, uh, I hope we can say his podcast. Yeah, now, yeah, Restaurant Eric Unstoppable. Yeah. He, you know, he asked me a question I'd never really thought about. And he said, well, what advice would you give somebody who's about to open a restaurant? And um, I mean, there's a million things. But one thing I had never really thought about that I did was that before I even moved back to Springfield, I dined at every potential restaurant that could be potential competition. Great. So every fine dining I totally restaurant. I recommend that. Yeah. And then I said to myself, can I do better than them because if i can't why would i even you know so many restaurants you know let's say you're you 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 make the best chili in the world in your head you want to open a chili parlor yeah right. and so you open a chili parlor but then you come to realize there's five other chili parlors and their chili's better than yours you know what are you going to do now right do your research before you spend the money always yes. yeah. yeah yeah more sound advice so, you know, back to the story, I opened Clary's uh, in 89, February 3rd, 1989. I had taken possession of the building on January 2nd because it was the day after New Year. So I remember that, you know. And yes. So I opened it in about 31 days and it was kind of crazy, but it, we did a soft opening and uh, I opened on a Friday night and I was like, God, that's kind of crazy. I'm like, no, nobody knows I'm opening. So I would rather do the first week and then I get a whole week before that second weekend when I know I'm going to get rocked that because the word's going to get out of if course. we get a good job. Word of mouth is always powerful. The most. Uh, it's everything. It is. I mean, it really is. And that's why For those people, impressions are yeah. so important and lasting ones, you know? Yeah, because you don't get another chance. You don't. That's right. So, so keep going. We, we, yeah, we, we did. A, you know, we did a pretty good job. I did have service training, but I'll never forget the first night, a guy who ended up being one of my best waiters ever. He, he kept, he goes, James, I can't get this bottle of wine open. And he was turning the corkscrew the wrong way. So, you know, it's, it was that kind of stuff, you know, of but course. he had oh, missed no. the, the training and yeah. I hired him as a last minute addition and just threw him on the floor, which, you know, but he was a nice enough kid and had that great hospitality heart. The guests were kind of uh, forgiving. And I will admit that the first weekend, probably half of my business were people I knew, you know, from my parents, friends and stuff. They're like, oh, you know, those Clary boys opened a restaurant. So yes, we'll go, let's go check it out. <laughs> check out that restaurant. And 
I'll tell you what really put us over the top was about a month after we opened, unbeknownst to us, a newspaper reporter had come in and eaten it. I had no idea. I didn't know who these guys were that at the happens. time. Yeah, reviews. Oh. Right? Today, it's all about Thank- online reviews. Back then, it was about newspaper write-ups. You- that's right. Yeah. yeah, there was no Yelp. No. You know, I mean, I know, huh? it was newspaper. But it was well, important and it was powerful and they uh, had an influence. Oh, oh it, people don't today, younger people don't realize back then you read the paper. That's how you got information, mm-hmm. right? That's right. I remember the last line in that review. I probably got it lying around here somewhere, but the you last line was this talking about could get to be a habit. Awesome. That's a great yeah, way. And, oh, dude. That sounds we, like a good review. That, yeah, it was a great review. We were very fortunate that we didn't mess this guy's table up. No, we had a good system, and that's why. You, yes. you have Remember what we started this with, treat every guest as if they were the most important thing in your life. Well, fortunately, the guy's name was Bill Tatum now. He's a friend I've known him for years. Fortunately, when Bill came in that first time, uh, he was taken care of, and the food was great. Awesome. So, yep, yeah, you hit it all. That's yeah, terrific. That's cool. That's very cool. Yeah. So we, uh, I sold Clary's in 06. And in the meantime, oh my gosh, I, I've done a lot of things. Uh, I, you know, going back to the interview I did last week with Eric, uh, I told him about a restaurant I did for Andy Williams. And he was, who? Eric's a young guy. You oh, know? he didn't know who Andy Williams was. No, he didn't know who Andy Williams Big was. Big 70s Which icon. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's what I said. I go, you know, in his day, he was like the Michael Jackson of the time. For sure. You know? and yeah. I remember something that Andy told me when I was doing this rest that really kind of blew me away. He said, when John F. Kennedy was killed, Jacqueline's staff called Andy to come to the White House. That was the first person, friend. He was that close to the Kennedys. No you know? kidding. So, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, yeah, I didn't either. You know, I learned a lot from this guy. He was... Uh, about the different side of the business. He was really a neat man. I was honored that he would choose me to help him open a restaurant on his property in Branson. That was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Totally. I still yeah. remember that song, Moon River. <laughs> well, it was called the Moon River Grill. No kidding. All right. Yeah, the, and he, well, he had the Andy Williams Moon River Theater. Yes. And uh, he had a restaurant on his property, and it was operating. They just weren't doing well, so... I had gotten to know him because he used to eat at my restaurant when he came to Springfield. It's about 30 minutes away from Branson where he lived. And uh, I did a his ha- I did a party at his house for his staff one Christmas. And anyway, got to know him. And when this restaurant, they hadn't paid him rent in a year. And he was just about done. And he said, hey, you want to open a restaurant? I got a perfect spot for you. And I'm like, at the time, Roger, I had three restaurants. I'm like, I don't need a fourth. So I, I said, but well, Andy, why don't you do it? He goes, I don't know the business. So that was my first consulting gig. And I kind of just fell into it. You know, I didn't even know at the time. I don't even think I called it consulting. I just, I'm opening a restaurant for you, Andy. I mean, he knew nothing about it. He knew what it wanted it to look like. And he kind of knew the food that he wanted. But it was just generalized. He's from the Midwest. Most people don't realize that. They associate him with California and Hollywood and all that stuff. But he's from the Midwest, and that's what he wanted, Midwestern comfort food with an upscale twist. So that's what we did. It's pretty cool. Great, great stories. Yeah. So, Chef, you know, what are your current plans? you got a lot you're cooking up right now. So why don't you tell us about, <laughs> you know, what's on your plate, Chef? Well, uh, you know, I've had a business uh, called Clary's Consulting, and I'm rebranding or have rebranded, I should say. I finally got my uh, website up. I, I like to learn new things, Roger. And I, I had several people that offered to do this website for me, some even for no charge, just their friends, or they owe me a favor, or whatever. I wanted to do it myself because we can never stop learning. And I never built a website. And with the tools that are out today, it wasn't that hard. So it's the rest, the, T-H-E, restaurant guru dot net is up and running so consulting business is my primary uh bread and butter and i have uh, i have a couple clients local i have one in tulsa and a guy i've been working with in rogers arkansas so i've been traveling quite a bit um you and i have talked I, i really respect and admire the work you've done and your website i think you know what what you're offering people is just an incredible value is that knowledge and wisdom that took 
you and I dozens of years to get, you have it on your website. And so that's kind of the direction I'm going. I know you and I hopefully are going to collaborate on some stuff. We got yep, a couple of I've projects got, uh, yeah. on the front burner because after this podcast, yep, yep, yep. we'll jump into some of those things. I'm really fortunate to have met you. Like I said, kindred spirits. We have passion for the business. <laughs> we have such like yep. philosophies. And I know you got so much going on. It's it's really been great to talk to you. And you've shared some yeah. real nuggets, some real wisdom nuggets that, that you know, are just Well, gonna... I appreciate that. And, you know, one Food of the things. That, uh, yeah. So to speak, I've got a book on Amazon called Server Sales Training. It's an ebook. So if uh, you know, spend four bucks on a book. I, I, the book sales are not uh, a huge source of income for me. I don't care about that. But if people want to learn how to sell, yes, any re- you know, you talked about that server that was knowledgeable, but she never offered anything. This so that's what this that book is all about. And yeah, it's been great talking to you today. I I really admire your work and, and appreciate the friendship really me as do. well well thanks for joining me on the rocky restaurant podcast chef and i'll catch you again okay see you around see you later Take care. nice talking to you thanks for listening to, to the, the restaurant, restaurant rockstars, rockstars podcast for lots of great resources head over to restaurantrockstars.com and while you're there download a copy of the book rock your restaurant it's a game changer see you next time